Okay, I've been asked to talk about something different, which is what does a working journalist need? And I suppose that's more than just journalists, because, I mean, we've got a blog, for example, and academics do much the same kind of thing as journalists. We get information, we publish it, we annoy people. We may sometimes publish it in different places, but it's the same kind of thing. So, how do we go about protecting sources, exposing wrongdoing, and occasionally digging an elephant trap for the government of the day? in the world that Snowden has told us about? Well, I'm going to look at three levels. The science and the engineering, that's number one. That's the basics, the foundation. The second is the tradecraft. Everybody's got tradecraft. You know what that is. And finally, the environment and how can we change it. Now, we've um, seen stuff about crypto at lunchtime. And since the 70s, we've had public key cryptography, a magic bit of mathematics that let you send secret messages to people you've not met. And that's the problem. You've not met them, so you don't know who they are. So there are middle person attacks. You may be given the wrong PGP key. You may find that you're speaking to the NSA thinking that you're speaking to Fred, and Fred is speaking to the NSA thinking that he's you. The technical details of this vary wildly depending on whether you're using PGP, G, GPG, or SSL, TLH, or SSH, or whatever. Uh, but you've got to understand this stuff and pay attention to it. The second problem, and the biggest, bigger problem for a typical investigative journalist, is that if you're the only guy in Burma who's using PGP, right, you've got a problem. Right? Burma Telecom will look through its um, net flows and say, aha, <laughs> this is the door that you break down, and you're going to be taken away in leg arms. So the next thing you need is anonymity. Now, anonymity started over 30 years ago with a brilliant idea by David Chow in the Netherlands. Uh, to make anonymous emailers. You send an email from here to there and from there to the next place and so on to its final destination, and you encrypt it at each step. Now that we're in the world of the World Wide Web, we use TAR, which was originally, in fact, developed at US Navy Labs. And the developer there, Paul Syverson, realized that if the only people in the world using TAR are US Navy spooks, then they're going to be dead easy for the opponents to identify and neutralize. So they opened it to the world. And the idea is now that US Navy spooks operating in, for example, the Gulf will have their communications completely swamped in a torrent of Arab men looking for porn and getting through the various censorship countries that systems that places like Dubai have. And that's great. It works. From the point of view of Navy spooks or Arab men looking for porn, it's great. From GCHQ's point of view, Tor sucks. Right? This is something that we've helped to contribute to a bit on some of the maintenance and development. But TAR isn't a complete solution. First, it isn't a solution everywhere, because some places like China and Iran try hard to block it. And it's not a solution for all applications, because it has its limitations too. And again, if you're going to use it for real in circumstances where your source might be killed, you've got to learn to understand these limitations. As we said, anonymity loves company. You can only hide in a crowd. And so there's all sorts of other systems have been proposed for hiding information. Oh, one of my students did one a couple of years ago, whereby you'd take a picture of somebody and you'd hide a text message in the picture as a caption with a password. You would put another message in the picture without a password. So it had a legitimate use as a captioning system and also a use as a means of covert communications. But the problem is, until you can persuade a few hundred thousand people to use it, the fact that you've got it on your phone is a dead giveaway. So we end up, for many purposes, having to use mass market stuff like Skype and Gmail. And as I'll come to in a second, these can provide a surprising amount of value from the point of view of source protection, if we get the tradecraft right. Fourth, censorship-resistant systems. If you're running something like WikiLeaks and the bad guys over at State are trying to close you down by jumping on your credit card supply and everything like that, there's all sorts of other things you can turn to. Twenty-odd years ago, we started something called the Eternity Service in response to attempted press censorship by the Scientologists. And the idea was that you encrypt and fragment files so that they can be scattered holographically over the whole Internet. And if a court comes to you and says, here is an order for you to hand over the Pentagon Papers, you can say, search me. I don't know if this encrypted stuff on my disk has any of the Pentagon Papers in it or not. All you know is that over a million people's hard disks, the Pentagon Papers are somewhat stored. So that led to Publius and Freenet and Nutella, and then after Napster came along, you at Kazaa and others. Peer-to-peer -peer systems are potentially interesting, not just because they hold huge amounts of stuff, 
but because, as Snowden tells us, the NSA throws all this stuff away. Right? That's the first thing that happens when these bits come ashore at Bude, as Duncan was telling us. They take all the peer-to-peer -peer stuff and they throw it in the bit bucket. There's too much of it. Does that give anybody ideas? Hey. And um, as um, Duncan and others have been telling us, the NSA may do the hunting part of their mission by trawling through metadata and so on and so forth, but when it comes to gathering, when they've decided that you're the bad guy, then they also exploit endpoints. And they have way um, more sophisticated malware um, than many of the common criminals do. Um, there are no, for example, um, uh, jailbreaks available at the moment for the iPad, but if you go to government suppliers, they'll sell you malware that will run on an iPad. So because of the money involved, and because people who discover vulnerabilities now sell them for money to firms that sell them to spook vendors, um, there's all sorts of people in a dodgy supply industry who will sell malware to infect your PC, your phone, your tablet, and so on. And that's why if you're dealing with high value sources, you have to use something like Tails. But that is way too inconvenient for dealing with everyday walk-in defectors from Whitehall. And in any case, how does the average walk-in defector know that Tails even exists? You've got to have different strategies for that. What is Tails? Hey, uh, speak to knowledgeable people afterwards. It's basically uh, a PC that comes on a memory stick. You stick it into your PC, whole operating system, boots the whole thing up clean. It doesn't use any of the software in your machine. So if it has been infected by malware, by the NSA, that doesn't matter. OK? It means that, of course, um, you're limited in what you can do, but it prevents endpoint exploits being used easily against you. <coughs> Next point, I was delighted that Sai this morning um, mentioned the fact that he won't use classified information until he's got a second source for it. Because one thing many people don't realize is that many nuggets of information themselves are highly disclosive. Now, we've got a big row in Britain at the moment because the government in March just went and sold off 15 years worth of hospital medical records to about 1,200 different firms. That is, every time you've been in a British hospital since about uh, 1998, um, that, the record of that, with your name and address removed, but with your postcode and date of birth on it for convenient re-identification, has been sold to Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. And of course, if you have got de-identified records, you can re-identify people. Easy. Here's an example. Show me the medical records of all 48-year-old women with a nine-year-old daughter, both of whom have psoriasis. Step forward, Anne Campbell, MP out of 50 million people in England. It's as easy as that. Now, that is a tool that you can use as an investigative journalist, although for ethical reasons, I certainly hope that you won't use all this hospital data, but it's also something that can be used against you. And if somebody in Whitehall leaks you some stuff, then even if you use the most stringent technical security measures, you've got to think real, real hard about whether you're going to burn your source simply by running the story. And for that, you almost certainly have to discuss it carefully and in a grown-up way with your source. So this brings me to the nub of my talk, which is tradecraft. Right? Every business has got tradecraft. And in every business, tradecraft can be changing very rapidly as stuff goes online, as things that didn't used to be problems suddenly become problems, and problems that your grandfather used to worry about are just fixed. So 20 years ago, if you were doing journalism, you would first of all have to provide a way for sources to walk in. You would have a front desk in your newspaper office and um, somebody moderately helpful there who would actually put someone in touch with a journalist if they asked for that. You would hang around shows and fairs and clubs and you'd get to meet people, as, as I was uh, saying. Then when you've got your source, you meet somewhere innocuous. There's all the shoe leather stuff, as Sai described it. How do you make sure that you're not followed? Do you jump on and off buses? Do you walk down Oxford Street and look at your reflection in the window? It's great fun, right? Try it. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good way to spend a, 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 an afternoon with a few mates trying to teach yourself the basics of uh, surveillance and counter-surveillance. And then, of course, everybody knew years ago that for high-value sources, you don't use phones that might be tapped. OK, so, so what's new? Well. How do you get your tradecraft? The main source is common sense. The second source is a careful study 
of evidence, that is, cases where the authorities you know, busted some people from Greenpeace or whatever, and you can know what they do, what sort of capabilities they deploy. Old hands, older journalists, that's less relevant now with a technology change. Spy novels. Hey, and now we've got Mr. Snowden telling us all the stuff that the NSA can do and that it can't do. So in the old world, we used to be in a world where the government could watch anybody, but it couldn't watch everybody. Now, if you read Snowden, you might fall into a slough of despond and say, well, hey, now the government can watch everybody. Well, in theory they could, but there's only so many people in GCHQ and so many people in MI5 and so on, and they've got a certain priorities and tasking. So in practice, we may be not too far from the old world in which the government can only watch some of the people all of the time. Now, there's some caveats on that, but we have to start looking at the detail. To take a slight diversion, a couple of years ago, a US missionary, a, a Christian gentleman from Texas, came to us, and he said, well, how do we do covert communication then? Because um, he was spreading the word of the Lord in Pakistan, and there's a small problem that in Pakistan, if you convert from Islam to any other religion, you get executed. So, in such a circumstance, would you tell your converts to use PGP or TELS? Anybody? Well, you're getting close because you see what's likely to happen is that the Pakistani religious police will get one guy to pretend to be a Christian convert, and if you tell him, hey, you'd better start using PGP, then Pakistan Telecom will be searching all the traffic in the country looking for all seven PGP users in the country. And on Wednesday morning, they'll, they'll get the doors broken down. Find the, find the Bible, carry the guy off, cut his head off, sorted. Okay, that's your threat model. So what do you do? You tell him to use Skype instead. Three million users in Pakistan, most of them entirely innocuous, most of them people chatting uh, with relatives who have gone to Dubai or places like that to work. And so your incriminating traffic is lost in an absolute river of people chatting to their relatives. Problem, you better make sure you use a different Skype name to talk to each convert. Because if the secret religious policeman says, you know, my minister in Texas uses Ross J. Anderson 1 at Skype.com, hey, hey, then everybody I speak to in Pakistan is going to get their head cut off. So there's little technical details like this that you have to get right. This is what tradecraft's about. Next point, how are your sources going to walk in? There's been one or two people who've done stuff on this, but nobody's done anything really convincing yet. Remember the case with Damien Green just before the last election? One of eight civil servants had leaked a sensitive policy document to an opposition member of parliament, and they actually arrested the opposition member of parliament and searched his office in the hope of finding out which one it was. That didn't work, thank goodness. But suppose they had sent the frank policy paper to your newspaper. Suppose they had sent it electronically. And suppose you control through X key score and see everybody who's contacted the Guardian in the past 24 hours. And suppose you can use the same tools to go through the civil servants' communications, both from work and from home and from their mobiles and so on and so forth, and look at all the people that they have contacted in the previous two weeks, and you find, aha, it was Sir Humphrey Appleby who spoke to Professor John Griggs in Kent, and he phoned the Guardian ten minutes later. Whoops, got him. Arrest both of them. Sorted. So how do you stop that? Well, suppose that you had on your newspaper website a comment facility whereby people could get in touch with a journalist who wrote a particular article. And suppose that your website were encrypted so that the spooks couldn't tell whether someone was just reading a news article or posting a comment on it. Our blog, lightbluetouchpaper.org, is like that. And if you want to make traceless communication with me, the sort of thing you might do is set up a throwaway Gmail account um, for, to, to get a response, then go to our website through Tor, and then go and look for a posting two or three years ago, post a comment on it. All of the comments that are posted to old postings will be sent to either me or one other person for review for spam. And when we see that it's a genuine message, well, hey, 
and you tell us to call you back on such and such a Gmail address, and we do that. Sorted. That's how you can do um, deniable communications easily with readily available tools. But, you, but you've got to figure out that this is something that you need to do. You need to sell it to your editor, and then you've got to get it implemented competently. So this brings us to the question of how we change the environment. Now, if you encrypt your website, it enables people to contact you tracelessly. But it's got further advantages. It means that it's also not obvious who read what. So it means that if the Chinese want to censor a particular story in The Guardian about Mr. Xi's relatives making $100 million in a New Jersey property deal, then they've got to censor the whole Guardian. They can't just nail that particular article. This is a real issue, right? Because all through the Snowden stuff, members of the US Armed Forces have found that their firewalls have been stopping off all the Guardian stories on, on, on Snowden. OK? So if the Guardian had been encrypted, that would have made a more difficult decision for the uh, guys in, in the forum. And the other interesting thing is that as more and more people encrypt their website, that means that the choke point for most investigators, that is those who can't use NSA resources but have to use police resources, have to go through mutual legal assistance. And that is slow and painful, especially if the website's in the States, because Congress won't give the money for the Department of Justice to clear its backlog. That, again, is the sort of thing that you want to know if you're doing this kind of thing. You want to know that although you have got stronger human rights in Germany, uh, it's, it's an awful lot um, easier for a British policeman to get stuff from Germany via mutual legal assistance than it is from America, because America is slower. What scope is there for regulatory arbitrage? Well, some interesting points here. The USA has constitutionally protected freedom of speech with no prior restraint. And US courts won't enforce UK libel judgments and freedom of speech is more broadly defined. So when our prime minister says that Britain should be the best place in the world to do online business, then what you should write when you write that story is to point out that only a nutter would base an electronic publication in Britain, given the legal climate here compared with what's available elsewhere in America or even for that matter in Germany. I'm sure I see Andy's nodding in agreement. Okay, so here's my conclusion. It doesn't make sense to build special systems to support investigative journalism any more than gumshoes need special cars or special hotels or special anything else. In fact, these make you stick out a mile. What's needed is the intelligent use of the systems that everybody else uses. Remember this phrase, anonymity loves company. And there isn't going to be a single solution because these things are inherently adversarial and in a moving technological environment. So whatever works well this year will probably not work at all in three or four years' time. So you have to think, what's your mechanism for keeping your policy up to date? What's your mechanism for refreshing not just your technical design, but the procedures and techniques that you teach your journalistic colleagues every two or three years? In short, this is about tradecraft. Don't despair at what Snowden has told us. Just treat it as a wake-up call to start doing things in a somewhat more modern way and use modern tools to advantage, just as the NSA is trying to. And remember, we can be an awful lot more adaptable and flexible than a vast bureaucracy of the kind they have at Fort Meade, with tens of thousands of people sitting in committees and writing memos to each other. And there's a book on this. Um, and uh, I've got a security engineering book that's got a chapter on this stuff, and you can download it free from the internet. So in case that's of any use. <laughs>